So we finished up talking about competition with the equations. Let's look at how these equations work in models. Here are those two equations for the growth of species, populations one and two, species one and two populations, influenced by the presence of the other species with the competition coefficients alpha and beta. We can use state spaces, which is a two-dimensional way to look at the dynamics of population, of species interactions, N1 and N2. If the plane is all combinations of numbers of species 1 and numbers of species 2, from 0 to many on the x-axis for species 1, 0 to many on the y-axis for species 2, we can look at equilibrium solutions for population growth for species 1, looking at an isocline, which is on the species 1 axis, K1, and on the species 2 axis at K1 divided by alpha, the competition coefficient. If the numbers of species 1 are greater above the isocline, species 1 will decrease. If they're under or less than the isocline, it's less than the carrying capacity, so it will increase. That's species. We can look at the same for species 2. These are the equilibrium solutions for population growth for species 2. In this case, the isocline is drawn from K2 on this, the y-axis for species 2 and K2 divided by beta on the x-axis. So this dn2 dt equals 0, that's the isocline, the line of no population change. If the numbers of n2 are above, it's greater than the carrying capacity of species 2, so it will decrease in number. And if it's below, it's less than the carrying capacity, so it can increase. So some of you might have taken linear algebra, but if not, when you have two vectors, like this one and this one, their sum is the line in between them, like here. And remember that if the value of n1 is above its isocline, it will decrease. If it's below, it will increase. And the same thing for values of n2 and the species 2 isocline. So here we've put the two isoclines together on the same phase plane. And there are four different ways that these lines can be arranged and four possible scenarios for different outcomes. In the first, species 1's isocline is entirely above species 2's isocline. So if we add the vectors, and let's say there's a point out here where species 1 and species 2 are both above both their isoclines, species 1 will decrease in the x direction, species 2 in the y direction, and the sum will be taking the point toward this way, just as 1 is here. If it's below, let's look at point number 2, it's below both isoclines, so species 1 increases in the x direction, species 2 in the y direction. Their sum takes them in that direction until they're between. The combination of n1 and n2 is between, somewhere here in the middle between the lines. This is beneath the isocline of species 1, and so it will increase in the x direction.
However, it's above the isoclinus species too, so it will decrease in the y direction. And its sum will take it in this direction, moving, 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 until the final solution is that species 1 reaches its carrying capacity and species 2 is 0. Species 1 wins in this competitive interaction. The second option is in just the opposite of the previous one with species 2's isocline above species 1's. In this case, just as in the other, when it's above both, x decreases, I mean, species 1 decreases in the x direction, species y decreases in the, species 2 decreases in the y direction, sorry. Their sum takes it this way. And the other one, like before, if they're both below, species 1 will increase in the x direction, species 2 will increase in the y direction, and their sum takes them this way. But this time, if it's in the middle, this has been above species 1's isocline, so it will decrease in the x direction. Below species 2's isocline, so it will increase in the y direction. And that, oops, sorry, that's a messy line there, will take them in this direction, going to the carrying capacity of species 2 and Species 1 is 0 at this point, so. Both of these scenarios, 1 and 2, involve competitive exclusion of one species by the other. The third option is a pleasing one to me, somehow. Neither species drives the other to extinction, and you can see that the isoclines cross, but these points are not the carrying capacities, but rather the carrying capacity of the other species divided by the competition coefficient. So if the points are above both isoclines here, species x decreases in the x direction, y in species 2 in the y direction, sorry, species 1 in the x direction, and their sum takes them here. If they're both below, x will increase, Spe species 1 will increase, species 2 will increase in the y direction, and so that takes them this way. But where they are, end up between the two isoclines, you'll have different vectors. On this part, it's below species 2's isocline, and so it will increase in the y direction. It's above species 1's isocline, so it will decrease in the x direction, and that takes it this way, ending up at this stable equilibrium point here, and the same for if it's in this other quadrant. So in this scenario, neither species drives the other one extinct. But in the fourth scenario, competition coefficients are stronger, and here you can see that along the x-axis the um, carrying capacity of species 1 is above this modified carrying capacity of species 2, also over here. K2 is the top one. So what happens here is there's no predictable winner, and it depends on where this point starts out in the phase plane. What is the number of n1 species 1 and number of species 2? If it's out here, it's above both. Species 1 will decrease in the x direction, species 2 in the y direction, and this will come here. If it enters this part of the interior, then because it's below species 1's isocline, it will increase in the x direction. It's above species 2, decrease in the y. 
and it will come this way, eventually species 1 will win. However, if that initial number is up here, and they both decrease species 2 in the y direction, species 2 in the x direction, that will carry it into this part, and then it will go toward species 2's carrying capacity. So this is probably the most interesting, where you get competitive exclusion in an unstable equilibrium depending entirely on the starting abundances of both species. Now these are fun to figure out if you actually have numbers with a pencil and paper or maybe a calculator. Our textbook's website has living graphs. There are many other ways to work on these things, so it's fun to fiddle around with them if you like. So for an example of competitive exclusion in the real world, let's look at scale insects on oranges in California. In this picture you can see these really big brown things are the adult scales. The first instars of scale insects are tiny little crawling insects like these guys here. But once they settle in, they tap into the plant and then start growing. And so these are different stages of scale insects. These scale insects are attacked by parasitoids and growers relied on these parasitoids to help control them. But over time, in 1940, one species dominated Aphytus chrysomphalae. In 1958, Lignanensis started taking over the plain green. Until 59, it dominated. But then by 1961, Aphytus melinus became dominant. In plants, competition is influenced both by nutrient availability and the resulting habitat productivity. <clears throat> so you get zonation very much based on tolerance of plants and their competitive ability. Where there's an increasing physical stress as the plants are growing into the more salty water and conditions anoxic for the roots. <clears throat> so the most tolerant plants are found there the upper borders are set by competition and the better competitors thrive there. You can experimentally investigate these things in garden or um, greenhouse experiments. When you add extra fertilizer, the stress-tolerant plants may become better con competitors. As you can see here, y-axis is plant cover and the performance of control and fertilized plants. The outcome is changed in each situation. Some of the most famous competition experiments were performed by Joe Connell in the rocky intertidal zone of Scotland, where there are two kinds of barnacles that grow on these rocks, and they show distinct zonation. In the lower intertidal, you'll find balanus. And the lower water, the lower zones are really a little bit better because the animals are longer underwater and can feed more of the time. The upper zones are more exposed, and that's where you find more thamulus. In the middle zone, balanus hogs the space. And in the bottom, balanus is there, but controlled also by more predation. The way balanus competes is it grows and pries the thamulus off. So Connell's experiments involve removing barnacles and then allowing them to recolonize. When he removed balanus, Thamelus was able to grow easily. The reason they can outcompete, the balanus can outcompete Thamelus, is they grow more quickly and their edges get under the edges of the Thamelus and pry them off. 
But Thamelus has the advantage in the more, um, the upper zones, the more, the more stressful areas, because they can um, hold themselves in a dry condition longer and survive. In these kinds of competition experiments and situations, it seems that asymmetry is usually the rule. Things don't work in both directions equally, because when Thamelus was removed from the upper places, Balanus didn't move any higher because it wasn't resistant to drying. So these are important predators in this ecosystem, sea stars. I love this picture of all of them conglomerated together when the tide goes out. And Robert Payne looked at the importance of predators in the outcomes of competition in the rocky intertidal zone of Washington. He built exclosures over the... Um, barnacle places to keep out the sea stars and he found that the prey species, the barnacles grew but also their diversity decreased and this is because the starfish predation limited the superior competitors, barnacles and mussels and let less strong competitors survive increasing the diversity of the habitat. This is a, another experiment with a similar outcome. When tadpoles were subject to intense predation, three tadpole species grew equally well. This shows their weight at metamorphosis in the upper graph. But when predators were removed, one species outcompeted the other, and one species was nearly eliminated. Sometimes the negative effect of one species on another isn't really competition, but apparent competition when it's mediated through a third species or some other phenomenon. For example, <clears throat> one species may feed its predator, and then its predator also eats more of another prey species. The two prey are not competing, but one has a negative effect on the other through the predator. And scientists locally are finding that corals are negatively affected by algae. But this is not direct competition either. Algae, it turns out, support microbial enemies of the corals. They secrete polysaccharides, and the microbial enemies of the corals thrive in this. So they discovered this by doing experiments where using antibiotic treatment showed coral species surviving better when those microbes were eliminated. So... Even if it looks like competition at the outset, sometimes you need to take a closer look to figure out what's really going on.